I'm really honored to introduce Greg Bordowitz and to be in conversation with him. And in many ways, the issue of risk pools started in casual coffee date conversations with Greg years ago. Um, I can't quite mark when the basket of conversations that we've been having over the years about identity and illness and activism and art and generations and pedagogy, like those, all of those categories are just what our friendship is. Um, plus he's my boss, he, he <laughs> hired me to teach, so that's nice. Um, and so Greg, in addition to this evening, will be, uh, is currently writing a piece that will be a digital project for the risk pool issue, which will come out in a number of months. And a lot of the topics here um, are part, again, with the category slippage, um, certain words that we've been thinking through and talking about together, uh, vector, stigma, illness. Um, we're kind of finding the shape of a piece of writing through seeing what shape the ideas force. Uh, so Greg is the author of many things. Uh, most recently, just out maybe even today, from After All Books is Glenn Ligon, I Am a Man, untitled I Am a Man 1988. Um, so please look for that. It was too soon to have some available here, but it is out. And yeah, please welcome Greg. It's funny, I've been introduced as many things, but never a boss. <laughs> I'll embrace it. Um, yeah, uh, so I just dropped the clonopin. It'll take effect in a little bit. Um, how many people are, you don't have to answer this is kind of a rhetorical question, but if you, if you want to like be, you know, just give me witness or something, like how many people are on, uh, currently on an anti anxiety or antidepressant at the moment? Okay, so thanks for giving witness to that. That's good. I'm actually going to do something. Oh, well, that's good for you, I guess. I hope. I hope it's working out. Um, it's, it's, it's good for me. It's kind of it's happening. Um, uh, actually, that's a kind of reprise of uh, something that we used to do in the AIDS activist movement. Um, uh, I'm a person with AIDS, many of you probably know that, um, but in the early 80s, I learned this from a, a generation of older activists like Michael Callan and Griffin Gold and Max Navarre, all who were uh, AIDS activists and died of AIDS uh, in the 80s. So uh, at like a people with AIDS health group meeting or uh, even at just general meetings, um, someone like me would say, um, I'm a person living with AIDS and um, do not risk your security or safety. Um, but if you could, is there anyone else in the audience now living with HIV? If you could raise your hand. Okay, I don't see any hands. And please do not, do not answer if you feel in any way vulnerable. Um, is there anyone in the audience who uh, is experiencing uh, an ailment, an illness, a challenge to ability uh, currently at the moment? Yeah, okay, so keep your hands up. Um, is there anyone who knows someone as part of a care team is taking care of someone who uh, has an illness, serious illness, um, needs care uh, with challenges to ability or illness or, yeah, so, thank you. So we are uh, together on that, right? I just don't like this feeling like, uh, you know, ta-da, Greg Border with with AIDS. Um, <laughs> Uh, although a large portion of my career is based on that. Um, oh, I forgot to plug in my phone. Because uh, I, uh, I have a few calls to make. Can just uh, talk amongst yourselves. Um, got a few emails to do. No, I, I have a playlist <laughs> of uh, stuff. 
uh, that I want to talk about. Gimme Danger. Uh, how many people got that reference? Well, uh, do you know how many people know that song? Few people. Uh, I was going to ask another question, but it would be redundant. Which would be, to, how many people? For how many people was that song meaningful? So, one person. So five people know the song. One person. Uh, so I'm going to play it right now because um, I've been thinking a lot about um, a kind of culture that informed my adolescence and youth, which I kind of had a shift out of when I became an activist, but still retained um, an ethos that was really central to uh, the activism and AIDS activism specifically I'm talking about that I would eventually go on to do. And so I, I, now in retrospect, it's interesting to think about how was it that I and others reconciled a basically punk culture, which has its roots in 19th century decadence, which I'll talk about, which has its roots in romanticism, the Liebes Tote, I will talk about that. Um, how did we recognize, reconcile that uh, with uh, a health movement? Um, so give me danger. I'm really into listening and listening sessions, so we're going to listen to whole songs, even though that infringes copyright. <laughs> and um, you're just not allowed to dance, I heard. I can play them, it's fair use, but we can't dance. I can't play these for the purpose of dancing. <laughs> you're warned. <laughs> <laughs> Little stranger. 
before dawning? Um, give me danger. Don't give me shelter. I don't need your shelter. Give me danger. Right? No? Can I get a witness on that? <laughs> right? Give me shelter, the Rolling Stones. I don't need that. I need danger. Risk. Little stranger. And I feel your disease. I'm contagious. My danger is contagious. I don't need shelter from your danger. I don't even need to know you, little stranger. Right? How does it feel to walk through the world contagious? Good. <laughs> Powerful. Not after the AIDS epidemic. Right? Or maybe so. Right? That required a lot of somersaults in the air. Right? To go from that kind of swagger to a different kind of swagger. Right? Which we translated into how to have promiscuity in an epidemic, which is an essay by Douglas Crimp, which talks about the fact that gay men invented safer sex because no one else was researching it. So Michael Callan and Dr. Shows, Joe Sonnabend and uh, a bunch of other people got together and thought, well, it's probably a sexually uh, communicated disease, and so maybe condoms would be a good idea. Um, anything that would prevent blood-to-blood -blood contact would be a good idea. They handed out pamphlets on the boardwalk at Fire Island, right? Because the CDC wasn't on it, right? So you could still go to the meat rack. That's the place where people went cruising. <laughs> Read Dancer for the Dance, for Christ's sake. Um, and um, so, you know, th this kind of um, attitude required a kind of shift in articulation but didn't necessarily require an entire shift in attitude. Rosa von Pronheim in the early 80s made a very unpopular film. How many people have seen A Virus Has No Morals? One person that I can see. I can hardly see you. So, so Jeff Price has seen that film. <laughs> And um, uh, that's, that's a film made by a very famous uh, gay liberation filmmaker, um, German, uh, who made a lot of films. But A Virus Has No Morals was a, a science fiction thriller about uh, a group of people with HIV going around and randomly infecting people with HIV until the government cared, which I hated at the time. Because I was trying to, I was part of a group of people who was like trying to, who was actually wheat pasting um, uh, graphic images of how to put on condoms and how to clean syringes in New York City subways because there was no public uh, AIDS education at that time. Um, and uh, I get time jumbled up. You know, this is early 80s, late 80s. You know, the AIDS epidemic started in 79, 80, maybe earlier. That's when people started to get sick and there were rumors. Um, and um, people started dying, but no one really knew what was going on. Uh, you all know, or perhaps you know, that it was, the disease was first called uh, gay-related immune deficiency, right, GRID. Um, and that was when there was an incorrect epidemiological picture uh, because there was an article of uh, five men uh, with Kaposi sarcoma, which was a rare cancer that people with uh, HIV were getting, and another article about uh, a small group of men getting pneumocystis pneumonia, and I forget which coast was which, uh, but it was in the same morbidity, mortality, weekly rate report in the early 80s. Um, 
and the morbidity mortality weekly rate report, which is published by the Centers for Disease Control, speculated that somehow uh, these diseases in very young men, which were very rare diseases and very and extremely rare diseases for young uh, people, uh, were attributable to, this is a quote, some aspect of a shared lifestyle. That's what they say, some aspect. We speculate that this must, might have something to do with some aspect of a shared lifestyle. At the same time, if you look back at the record, uh, tuberculosis was exploding in the Bronx. Um, and you look back at the epidemiological record now, you can see actually the various opportunistic infections that would come to define uh, immune disease and a HIV were happening all over the boroughs. Let's just talk about Bronx. Um, it actually w was a pandemic. We were aware, in fact, that uh, thousands of people were dying in Africa and other places all over the world. Um, but the epidemiological picture wasn't so clear. And it, it took until 1991 until ACT UP forced the CDC to recognize the opportunistic infections that specifically uh, affect uh, biological women. 1991, a series of uh, very large protests outside the Center for Disease Control to get those opportunistic infections recognized as indications of AIDS, which meant getting resources and diagnoses and um, the services that would come with them. Am I pissed? I am still pissed. I, am st I think I'll be pissed all my life. Um, does it mean I don't like music? Um, so, you know, I arrived uh, from the boroughs. I'm a, I'm a bridge and tunnel, okay? All right, let's just get it out there. I'm bridge and tunnel. I arrived to the East Village in 1983. Missed the Mud Club, but caught the Anteria. <laughs> Meaningless to a whole, a whole group of people. Uh, Pyramid Club. Even more me meaningless. Um, but I was a club child um, and a drug user. And uh, uh, I, could call, I consider myself a sex radical. An anarchist sex radical don't need any labels. Never mind that anarchist, of course, is a label. And um, <laughs> never mind the contradictions. Don't need labels. <laughs> Uh, but then uh, I saw the value of enfranchisement and I very much wanted to be part of the gay community and um, be part of the struggle, uh, although I've had a very peripatetic sexuality. Um, and uh, I've been identified, uh, many identities have appended to me. I've just decided, I, my version of identity politics is just to take on as many identities as possible. <laughs> until the whole structure just collapses. Uh, that's me. Before I share any TMI, um, I want to play another song. There was a bonding mechanism in punk. This is not correct, okay? This is not politically correct, right? This is called Cretan Hop. It's by the Ramones. I saw the Ramones so much. Uh, they, they play, I come from the island. They played Long Island. They were a working band. They never got a really good record contract. I, I had a fake ID since I am 15 or something like that. And um, so I used to go see the Ramones play on Long Island clubs. So, and then I saw them at CBGB's. Um, I'm sorry, I'm really old. I was there. <laughs> uh, so, um, but th this is about the bonding mechanism of not being normal, right? You'd probably know this song better, and it's shorter, but I'm going to play the whole thing. <laughs>
So, um, I'm playing the whole songs because I want to go back to Give Me Danger. That hook, Give Me Danger, the bass line, everything, I mean, it's not just the words. I could, I could just perform the words of these songs um, as poems because they are great poems. Um, and I, I, I submit the Ramones were one of the greatest group of minimalists ever. <laughs> I suggest if you want to mine the riches of the Ramones that you don't listen to one song that you, I know it's hard to find the time, but just sit down and listen to the entire album Rocket to Russia from beginning to end. That's how you will understand the Ramones. Fast, right? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, right? Um, that, that the Rockets Rush is a concept album. Um, all right, I'm not going to geek out here. Um, so the gimme, you know, the baseline of gimme, uh, gimme danger really is kind of dangerous. It really is connotes a kind of violence. Uh, it embraces that kind of violence. Eros has violence. Um, very strange thing to say in these days, but it still does, uh, and um, that's part of the complexity of a lot of the issues we're facing at the moment. Um, uh, what's this is a side note, but. Um, uh, um, I think it's a really important historical moment because uh, violence and sexuality are being recognized in the ways that they're perpetrated. Uh, the way the violence is perpetrated through sex under patriarchy, and I stand with uh, women uh, or anybody who um, gives voice to the way that they've been abused within a patriarchal system. So I'm not, when I talk about uh, Eros has violence, I am talking about a complexity that we have to wrestle with and find a new language for. Um, uh, but that does not mean I'm making any kind of, um, I hope, uh, unclear, regressive, or defensive argument around that. Because um, I, I, um, I stand with those who um, give voice to their subjection to uh, violence perpetrated by patriarchy. Um, And I think I have been in a different way. Whoa, this is, this is what happens with improvisation. So the one thing you gotta understand about our politics, which you might share, is that we understood that homophobia and sexism were both caused by patriarchy. That was our intersectional politics. That that was the organic link between gay liberation and women's liberation or one of the organic links. Um, it gets even more complicated because you can't even parse those two movements exactly because um, of lesbians. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm serious. I mean, inter the, the inter intersectionality was invented by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw in the late 80s uh, in the context of legal law. That term, intersectionality, it was first used by Kimberly Crenshaw, who's a legal scholar, who was trying to figure out how uh, black women were uh, treated either as black or women within the legal system, and that the fact that they were never both was uh, not considered or ill-considered, and the legal system had no way of understanding the multiplicity of identities that we all have, right? We're many selves and many people to the various people we interact with. Identity is relational. So a, a legal theory becomes a very forceful political theory and is expanded and included within uh, our political movements for liberation. 
So the fact that, I mean, Essex, I was really good friends with Essex Hemphill and Marlon uh, Riggs, who are artists who you should know. Um, sorry, I'm again, again, that's the teacher in me. <laughs> it's the boss in me. Uh, <laughs> Essex Hemphill, uh, who whose poem I'm going to read later, um, if I have time, uh, was a great poet. Uh, he happened to be African American. Um, and he wrote very movingly about how he experienced homo homophobia from all sides, from everywhere, from within the black community, from outside, um, and how there was a split within black nationalism. Marlon Riggs r talks about this too in uh, his famous video, um, um, uh, Tongues Untied. Um, the pressure on gay black men uh, about you know, to decide are you black or are you gay as, a, as if that could be that decision could be made like on what side of the barricades are you going to be on was a historical question that many people suffered from with, with all different kinds of combinations of identity so that's why intersectional po politics becomes increasingly important uh, at this moment uh, within our debates, uh, why it's been brought into our debates. Um, I'm going to read a little, um, and then I'll play more music. I want to fulfill my obligation, but I also want to read a little. I'll fulfill my obligation. <laughs> uh, this is like the cliff notes. Okay, so Wagner did this opera called uh, Tristan and Isolde, uh, which is about star-crossed lovers who actually find themselves and are only able to live out their love by dying with each other. And a word was invented for this, the Liebestod. And I have Jesse Norman's recording of the Liebestod on my phone, but um, I'm not going to play it because it's very long, very beautiful. Um, so you can just look that up. Liebestod. I mean, Liebestod means the love death. It's one of those great things you can do in German um, where you can just make, uh, c contract words, just join them together, Liebestod. Uh, so the Liebestod is a romantic idea. It's not only specific to Tristan and Isolde, Romeo and Juliet. Um, I think even Sid and Nancy, you know, in some way, they, you know, that if you ever saw that movie, that was, there was an attempt to uh, render that as a kind of Liebes tote. Um, that was Sid Vicious and Nancy Spungen. Um, uh, that wasn't a joke, actually. Uh, I think that movie by, I think it was Stephen Frears. Help me out. Who remembers Sid and Nancy? Who made Sid? And, uh, oh, you don't remember. It wasn't for years. Uh, I'll look it up. We can we can, we can pause. We can relax. We we don't have to know at this moment. No one take out their phone. It's all right. It's all right. Blame it on me. It's my talk. I didn't do due diligence on the scholarship. All right. We'll survive. We'll survive. We won't know for ten minutes. So there was this idea of the Liebestod, um, which was very powerful, and as a kind of decadent, romantic decadent, I'm talking about romantic with a capital R, right? And the romantic movement is really interesting. Let me just put that out there. The romantic movement <laughs> was very interesting, was very much counter to industrialization and then the Enlightenment. Um, we were all taught the anti-aesthetic people, not all of us. I'm looking at some anti-aesthetic folks here who are good friends of mine. We were taught that romanticism is bad. Um, and in fact, uh, romanticism is interesting, right? Um, and uh, and it's okay, it's okay. Do that scholarship. I'm not even gonna tell you where to land on it. But uh, Heathcliff, you know, and, and the Brontes, that's also a Liebes tote. Um, Heathcliff banging his head against a tree upon the moor. So this is an enduring idea um, that in some ways, uh, there's a, a kind of beauty to be found in dying together. Not till death do us part when our IRAs kick in. <laughs> Which, and this Liebestod idea, I found anathema 
I was against it. I hated it in the 80s. In the 80s, I was very much against any kind of romanticism uh, because we were dying in front of each other and we were losing our lovers and there didn't seem anything good about that and there wasn't. Um, but it's interesting that that idea still endured and still endured in art that came out of that period if you look at uh, movies and books that were written at that time, there is still this kind of romantic pulse underneath the book like Borrowed Time, whose author I'm forgetting because I'm improvising and I'm not going to use Google at the moment, um, or Long Time Companion, which was an important movie in 1985. Um, there was this pulse, this underneath pulse of kind of romanticism. And in the 80s, that's when I started, that's, you know, I, that's when I started going to see operas. Um, I had great opera queen friends who took me to the opera. My first opera was De Valkyra. I'm proud of that. That's like really macho to admit. <laughs> I didn't start with La Boheme or Puccini. No, no. I started with the Valkyra. That was my first opera. He's gone crazy, right? That's what you're thinking. No, you should be. Um, I'm going to read a little few things from Risk Pool, so we'll, you'll have some context. Uh, so, okay, from romanticism to decadence, decadence is even more kind of amplification. Uh, decadence actually was a movement, le decadisme, in France. Uh, the main book is Against Nature by yours, Carl Wiesmann. The French title is A Rebour, which means either against the grain or against nature. Um, it's a great amazing kind of early queer book. It's about a guy who decides that he wants to go out and travel the world. He gets about many, like 10 miles away from his house, has the carriage turn around. He's just lucky enough to be extraordinarily wealthy. And he decides to turn each room of his mansion into a different uh, place in the world. So he turns his bathroom into the beach and he um, paints his turtle the same pattern as his oriental rug and um, it's about artifice. Against nature or against the grain is about the triumph of artifice. Because you can get that as a queer position, right? If, 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 if my being queer, if the fact that I have uh, gay sex is not natural, which is usually the argument, the natural law argument, then, well, I'm against nature. I'll choose being this rather than being part of nature. I don't know how you resolve that, reconcile that with eco-politics. We'll talk. <laughs> but that's the decadent position, right? And the punk position was all that combined, right? I could just play it like, like Iggy Pop. Just, I can't stop listening to Iggy Pop. I haven't listened to Iggy Pop in years. Iggy and the Stooges, you know, death trip. Let me take you on my death trip. Sick boy, sick boy. Let me run around. Sick boy, sick boy. Uh, there was this notion of freedom and rebellion. It's in rock and roll. Psychotic reaction by Dave Clark Five. The kind of uh, romanticization. Um, of altered states, not only altered states, it's not just the drug culture, it's about being, not being normal. Uh, which is why we're going to talk about this book. I promise we're going to talk about this book. Heather, I promise. Yeah. We're, uh, stigma. We'll probably talk about it later. Um, but Stigma is a great book. This, I announced it this, this largely as an assignment just because I want you to read it. It was written in 1963, Avant Lillette. It's not a book, but no, the word intersectional never comes up in Stigma by Irving Goffman. But I'll boil it down for you. Irving Goffman in 1963, with a tremendous amount of latitude, talking about the kinds of stigma that um, all kinds of people face because of sexuality, race, ethnicity, ability, um, drug addiction, incarceration. 
he, it just adds up and adds up, and he finally comes to the conclusion that the only unimpeachable identity in the United States in 1963 is a white male married to a woman with children, good at sports, That's the only unimpeachable identity. And Gerard Goffman is brilliant because he understands the code switching. If you want to, like the origin of the study of code switching, he understands what it means to move between identities and how each stigmatized identity creates its own inside and its own outside. And how if you're an outsider or an outlier, you go to places where you're no longer an outsider or an outlier. You go to places like this where you can be legendary. <laughs> or aspire to be. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm gonna read a little. So for the past, I don't know, year <laughs> that I've been writing this piece, um, I've been, uh, Corrine has helped me out enormously. She said, just write to me. <laughs> Um, every morning I write, every morning I, I wake up and I write at least one poem or more. Uh, and I have rules for those poems, but I'm not going to bore you with my uh, procedural uh, aesthetics. Uh, but uh, um, the poems are called Wake to Dread. Um, and uh, I've been writing them for uh, over a year. This is one Wake to Dread poem, September 22nd, 2017, Dean Street, where I live, AM. Waking into weird weather as a list, inventory to do verbs, first panic, inventory, insufficient tether, pissed and wired, a quantity, no calling. Why ontology has currency now, being a hurtling as a panicky swarm, weather unseasonably warm, dry breeze, allergies, sinuses, headache, sneeze, cough, lower back pain, kidney concerns, count, pills, punk, nostalgia, poetry, DIY, count off, four chord accumulations, speed, adding up to one sacred formula, release, release from illness, asking, please? Dear Kareen, waking with the fears of a survivor, living with HIV, diabetes, kidney disease, neuropathy, and doing relatively well. Now coping with the serious illness of friends, a few actually a constant persistent question, issues from myself to myself in the way inner interrogations follow the path of daily errands, intruding on work focus, Am I okay? Is there anyone around to see that I am okay? A rhetorical question looping through waking thoughts originating in past illness and loss. Today the question is not really about the state of my own health, rather the guilt that accompanies surviving well enough while others around me suffer. Terrible diagnoses, illness, aging, fragility. Another question persists. Why? Not why me, but why not me? So many dear to me are gone, the tangible grain of their voices persist, and the potential for loss of others pressing, the voice heard while reading a text or email, the voice that belongs to the sender. Still upright, thoughtful, a bit morbid, I question the very reason for survival, my own, knowing that the answer is beyond reason. Yum Kipper services this year did a number on me. Yearly memorial service saying Kaddish for my mother, praying for the well-being of others, knowing that a couple of friends are coping with terrible diagnoses. And this is all very local to the immediate circumstances of my circle. We know the world through news feeds and gossip. There's a disconnect between what we receive as news and what the body knows, the necessary and sometimes insane distinction between me, the voice that poses the question, and me, the other who doesn't know the answer. Love, Greg. I'll read one more. Dear Corrine, 
I came out as a bisexual in high school and I had girlfriends and I had sex with boys on the side. One of them panicked and decided he would tell the others that I was a faggot who came on to him when I was sleeping over his house. He felt guilty about the sex we had, boy sex, mutual masturbation. So I came out. I didn't deny it. My girlfriend at the time thought it was cool. <laughs> I got teased, taunted, his buddies often picked fights. I was an art kid cut my hair with scissors, disregarding any mirror or reflective surface, wore used clothes, a dog collar purchased in a pet shop at the mall. Among the art kids, the queer kids, I had a standing. It wasn't terrible. I survived and I moved to Manhattan. How does this fit within the composition? Laid on the East Coast, awake, not tired, another note. When I moved to Manhattan to go to art school, the summer I turned 18, 1982, the East Village was a place young artists went to live for the cheap rent. There was a queer scene. It wasn't called that, but it was some distance from the West Village and established gay life. Many of my friends were queer, questioning. Some already acknowledged their homosexuality. Un identity was something to be avoided, but not out of shame. We were beyond labels. We were free to do what we wanted, have sex with who we wanted, did the drugs we wanted. We worked a few days for money in construction mostly, then went to school, made art, partied. It was the beginning of the AIDS crisis, but few in my circles knew that. The virus hadn't been discovered, though people we knew were getting ill. There were rumors, but nothing substantial. Information wasn't flowing. Whispers were just spreading. Fairly soon after arriving in New York, news of a gay epidemic was emerging. The bisexual was considered a vector, a dangerous individual lurking in the shadows, a weak spot in the wall that separated the homosexuals in small neighborhoods and bars and edges of the city apart, seemingly far away from the straight world. The bisexual was considered a traitor in the gay world and a mortal threat in the straight world. Even in the newspapers, I was a vector of transmission. Coming out, the story of how I came out of the gay community, the complexity of identity, I wrote all about that in previous writings. Now in this context, I'm thinking about my life as a vector. For over half my life, I've been with men and women and people all over the gender continuum, some HIV positive, some HIV negative. I tested positive when I was 23, but I assumed I was infected before that. Male sex partners with whom I had unprotected sex got ill in 82 and 83. I used condoms, had safe sex starting around then. I didn't get tested when the HIV antibody test became available a few years later because as AIDS activists by then I knew that there were no protections for people who tested positive. People lost their jobs, got thrown out of their apartments. Nurses refused to enter hospital rooms, left trays of food at the thresholds. More and more I became visibly ill. This history is written. I made my contribution. But now I'm thinking about how I still understand myself as a vector. How for 28 years or more I've carried a virus inside me that has threatened my life and could infect others. How that thought is ever present and even when every precaution has been taken to minimize or eradicate the threat of transmission, diseased, diseased and lucky, still alive, but always a vector. Regarding identity, things have changed. There's an acronym, LGBT. The B still doesn't get much cred, though it's recognized and not so shameful. Let's not get into who suffers more among the alphabet. Let's just say that at 53 years old, the awareness of being dirty and tainted, sexual and promiscuous, all mixed with the confusion of sex and death, stirs a cocktail that sometimes sends me into a rage. Sometimes it leaves me melancholy and still, still, somehow it sets me apart from the body closest, literally closest to me. The disease, my infection, it even gets between different versions of myself. No longer avoiding mirrors, getting my hair cut in a shop like everyone else. Love, Greg. I'll stop there. I've been thinking about how long it's been taking to write this piece as I took a long time with mine. And I wonder how much is that, that dance with, given everything you said about identity and all of the facets of that, how um, with the self-awareness that the work equals a letting go, wanting to hold on a little more. Um, and I don't, that's not really a question, it's just a thing to throw in the air. Um, and the other thing that's really pressing on my mind right now in the form of like words that aren't quite a question but just tack a question mark to the end of it is 
is there a stigma of being a survivor um, in what, you know? Um, thank you. Those are a number of questions. Uh, <laughs> if I don't get to one, no. remind me. Um, first, I, uh, I really thank you for keeping that letter to yourself. Because uh, I find uh, I have widening circles of the way I work. Um, so I keep things to myself and then I often uh, share them with the most trusted and even ask, like, I don't want criticism, I just, just want you to read this or I just want you to tell me your thoughts, but no criticism, none whatsoever. Just love me. <laughs> and um, like Instagram, like or move on. <laughs> and, You're not uh, even on Instagram. <laughs> I'm not on Instagram, no, I'm not. Um, but, uh, and then, but then it widens, and then I do want criticism. And, and part of the process is that I was talking to Kareen earlier is that um, I, I, I think I long ago I realized uh, I'm not interested in confessional work, uh, even though I take a lot of risks in improvising now it's come out of a practice. And sometimes I, I leave off it. Well, I, tonight, I, actually, that's, I, I'll go into the shame spiral, the shame spiral, what I call the shame spiral later. That'll happen later. Mm -hmm. um, why did I say that? Why am I compelled <laughs> to tell groups of people uh, this thing um, or that thing? Um, but even so, I do prepare a lot, and I'm not really interested in a confessional art. Uh, I do take very seriously that the personal is political which is something that I've inherited from feminism. And, um, but I've also inherited a certain way of dealing with that. So a long time ago, Yvonne Rayner, who's a good friend of mine, but was I met as a student of hers, told me that the personal is political was very important to her, but insofar as the personal has uh, political relevance. And um, so what I, I took from that was that um, the and this isn't Avon's theory at all, so don't lay this on at Avon. This is what I got from it um, and, uh, and that strange asymmetrical relationship we call the student-teacher relationship. Um, uh, is that uh, part of what I do is therapeutic. There's a ton of writing that n no one will ever see. Um, and then there's some of it that I want to share and feel a need to share and I think resonates and does some work and I have faith that the, the uh, in the importance of that work and not because I'm special because I'm not because there are thousands of people who are living with the problems I'm facing um, if you ever, if you ever get, get your heart broken just watch TV and um, you'll see how like mediocre your story is. <laughs> um, thousands of people are having these experiences, and uh, not everybody. I'm sure you had a terrible breakup. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not pointing at anyone specifically. I just to the person in the audience who somehow felt that, that rendered your experience um, uh, not singular. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't think I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I come from a theoretical regime of, of structuralism, which basically is, you know, that, you know, it's, it's the identity. I'm a postmodern person, so, you know, we wear identities like hats and, you know, they're constructed and um, not everyone believes these things. Um, and I am aware that they also have genuine consequences in the world. You can get killed for your identity. Uh, so I understand the magnitude of that, which is the importance of the work. So, some part of the process is therapy, but when it's art, when I decide to call it art, then I don't own it anymore. If I need to own it, then you won't hear it. Um, so that's how I deal with autobiography. It's never confessional. Um, it's very worked out goes through a process, much like the one we've been going through. I'm very grateful to you. Actually, those letters, there was no, it was just, I just wrote them to you. I was just like desperate. Like, how do I think about these very difficult themes? And in a new way, you, you, I'm very grateful 
to you for this project because um, I'm really trying to think about this now. And which gets me back to the survivor question. I don't think there's a shame in being a survivor um, that I experience. Uh, I think there's a... Um, but stigma. Or, or stigma. But and maybe it's interesting that you swap those words. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, Venmo, I'll Venmo you $150. Um, <laughs> Deserve that. <laughs> um, that was about the mental health percent, uh, business. <laughs> I, I was saying that she's a, like a therapist. <laughs> um, it's terrible. This is how I know I'm not a comedian. I just play one in the art world because I often have to explain the jokes. Um, there's no. Uh, I said shame. What did you say? Stigma. stigma. There's no. I don't experience the stigma in being a survivor. Um, I because uh, it's just the world I live in. I, you know, I inhabit a bubble. Uh, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy with the bubble. Call the bubble a choir. I sing for the choir, I listen to the choir, I talk to the choir. I love the choir. It doesn't have to be bigger. For me, personally, I'm not looking for that. I can spend my life in the choir as an artist. So I don't really experience that kind of like stigma or anything like that. I do experience the pain of someone like me, of my generation, who went through some very difficult times in the 80s and 90s uh, and lost, you know, horrible cliches were invented by us and for us, like I lost half my address book. Um, lots, of, and lots of people went through that experience. But that, so it, there's this pain and that, um, that, that just that history doesn't seem to be visible or, I, or I, you know, the histories that are being written now and being filmed now, you know, um, really caused me a great deal of pain because you know, AIDS was never just a gay, gay white male disease. I tried to explain that before. And yet the histories that are being written now, the hagiographies that are going to be very public soon, um, don't tell the story of AIDS that I experienced. Um, and doesn't really speak to the fact that very few people have the, the drugs that are keeping me alive. It's still a pandemic um, that's uh, around the world, but also in this country, there's an alarming rate of explosions of HIV infection in uh, populations of women of color, in uh, populations of uh, men of color, gay men all over the country, uh, people who I identify variously and differently. Uh, along the lines of race, ethnicity, sexuality, gender, ability. Um, you know, the AIDS crisis is still beginning. You know, we had this period and we have these drugs, but the, if we have a history, um, it's gonna tell a very different tale um, and so I feel pain in that way. I don't know what it means to be a survivor. Here's another way I feel pain. I'm a survivor purely because of privilege and luck. I don't think that I did anything to be sitting up here right now. I didn't do anything that my friends didn't do. I just had access to medical care, access to the drugs when they were released, I'm talking about the protease inhibitors, and I was just lucky in that we don't still understand how the virus works and why it works faster or differently in some people and not in others. That's it, there's no, like, I have nothing else to say about that. Yeah. It, the one other thing I wanted, the one 
other note I wanted to bring into this before we have a couple of questions, um, and I think this is connected, is uh, just nostalgia um, on so many levels. Um, nostalgia, how do I parse this out succinctly? Um, the hagiography that you speak of, um, having a foundation and a nostalgia for a certain picture of the disease that is erroneously conceived of as over or as manageable. Um, but also the nostalgia, and this is sort of a leap into something else we were discussing earlier today, is how do you talk about a nostalgia, um, a misplaced perhaps nostalgia that my generation um, might inadvertently feel for the moment that you and your friends have lived through and that your art and your activism and the theory and all of the things that have been passed down pedagogically or culturally we now know as um, the 80s or AIDS or downtown or all of these kind of category slippages. Um, Greg and I took a breather be before sound check and went to opening ceremony and there was like racks of his track jacket up, his outfit, and you're like, this is actually from the 80s. And it's like, that was a funny moment, but it is, that's all combined. <laughs> you looked like you were a mannequin in the opening ceremony. It was bizarre. I was there! <laughs> but also all of the music that you played us and, and the, the framework of this evening and Iggy and the Ramones and the, um, you know, it's a cluster of things I'm saying here, but mm -hmm. go. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's nice to know that, well, you know, like my grandfather, who I love very much, uh, Harry, um, had an amazing style. Uh, he wore um, polyester leisure suits until his 80s, <laughs> a white shirt and a bolo tie. I don't know how he affected the bolo tie. Harry Harstein. I don't know where Harry Harstein uh, affected or how it got to affect the bolo tie. I just, it just makes me feel like, a, oh, so this is my leisure suit. Um. It's very chic. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, I'm deflecting. I'm deflecting. This, this is hard. <laughs> This is, I'm, I'm sorry, this, this is really hard. Um, and sorry to put you through this. No, no, it's, I, I willingly do this um, because I learned something from it and it wouldn't be worth it if this, there weren't stakes. Um, and it's hard for you too, uh, I imagine. Because um, I connect with you a lot. I mean, I don't know how many people have read Illnesses Festival, Corrine's brilliant, brilliant piece in uh, the first uh, iteration of the Risk Pool issue where we face a lot of similar issues. You rely a lot on AIDS politics as a precedent. Um, you talk about advertisements um, that um, uh, are ab about uh, addressing the healthcare issues that you face, uh, you know, how the consumer culture uh, mm -hmm. addresses it, and I do the two, I see advertisements the first time I was ever publicly addressed as a person with AIDS in a way that wasn't shaming was seeing an ad for the drug I was on standing on the subway in Chicago. And that was the only way that people with AIDS actually were, all of a sudden we were like welcome as members of the general public. For over a decade we weren't members of a general, the general public. We were just some group that was threatening the health of the general public. And on television, if we were interviewed, we had scrambled faces and potted palms. And, um, and there was only a few people who I mentioned, Max Navarre, Michael Callan, who, who were willing to go on television. And my, my cohort took their cue from them, largely because we had enough privilege where we could take the risk to be publicly out about having HIV in 1986, 87, 87, 88. Actually, I tested positive in 88. Um, so that's when I first. I didn't identify as having HIV before that, but I knew, I knew. Not medically, but... Because um, lovers of mine had died, um, and we had unprotected sex. Um, but I, I see you uh, 
relying on those aid politics and I'm very happy when I see that history being used in a way that forwards a much larger agenda uh, within ACT UP. I, you know, I, I really thought it was a revolution. Uh, um, there was a split between people who wanted to get drugs into bodies and people who wanted to get uh, socialized medicine for the country. And I was split because I needed drugs into my body, but I really felt like the movement had the potential to get socialized medicine for the country. Um, and, um, but that was a fierce debate in ACT UP um, that I just kind of, I don't know, like identities, I eat contradictions for lunch and uh, I just went with it um, and fought for both. Why choose? Why choose? Maybe drugs into bodies means socialized health care. Um, see, this is it. Now I go into this kind of fugue state, like, what am I asking? Why don't we have a, a question or two? I, oh, no, I just wanted to bond with you a minute. <laughs> I wanted to bond with you a minute about the oh, illnesses, uh, uh, festival as illness, because I think it's a, a, a tremendously important uh, and really beautifully written essay and I, and I think that that I, I, I am rather than in the negative I am very encouraged and cheered and honored that those politics that I described emerge in your politics and the politics of others who are facing not the same but uh, similar struggles so instead of talking about shame or stigma I would say that 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 I feel um, amazing about and encouraged, and and, and I, I don't think it's important. I once visited Concordia University, which is in Canada, and I was I, I was invited by the medical school, not the art school, and um, they asked me to do a lecture, and um, they one of the teachers was very proud. She said, you know, one, you know, we have our students taking. Uh, sugar pills every four hours like you're taking AZT we want them to have the experience of like having to keep track and I was like well, I don't want them to have that <laughs> I don't want anyone to have this experience did anyone did you ask me I mean where did you get the idea that they should have this experience um, I, in some ways I'm not I'm not I don't I'm not, I have no investment in nostalgia that way I don't want that for you and if you went through that or you're going through that, I bear witness to it. And I'm there for it. But I don't want that for anyone. I'm a physician. I'm a uh, physician of internal medicine. Uh, but I'm also an art collector. I've been collecting art for 20 years. I've been just part of these various communities. And Could you speak up a little bit? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Um, so I've been practicing internal medicine since 2001. Uh, seen a lot. And with all the changes happening in medicine right now that are really constraining the way that doctors have to spend their time, have to weigh uh, forces of economics and analytics with actually caring for individuals, I would say that I don't know of a single doctor who isn't absolutely struggling mm -hmm. in this moment in time to honor the subjectivity of individual people, regardless of disease. Mm -hmm. Just doing that. I actually happen to have a friend who's a patient this week and seeing it all through her eyes and advocating for her has been a nightmare. But I just throw that out there that mm -hmm. I think that um, the, the notions of vector and notions of disease are often thought with a sort of anonymity on the physician side. But there's also a really deep hearted concerned group of people out there struggling to get this right and they and they absolutely don't have the answers and they absolutely need to be led by people outside of the profession because they're getting it totally wrong within mm -hmm. um, 
So I'm just throwing that out there. There's a, there's a struggle on yeah. on this side as well. I'm glad you did. I mean, here's the intersectionality. Is you know, the, it, I, one of my doctors died of AIDS. You know, it's not, it's not like doctors and nurses, you know, don't have AIDS or don't have other medical issues or they're outside of it. I hear you, um, and I'm really glad you said that. Um, but within AIDS activism, there were many doctors, uh, many nurses who were brave. I know I just reported some stories that were true, that in the early days of uh, GRID and AIDS, that uh, medical attendants would leave were scared. There was no information. I even have like rachmanus for them. That means uh, uh, compassion in Yiddish. Um, the the um, you know, th th there was no information. So I, I hear you. I hear you. And thank you for that. Um, yeah. Maybe this historical frequency of romanticism. And um, when you were speaking, I thought a lot about disco. Because when I think about disco, I think about this kind of intersectionality that's um, literally demolished in, in 79. And... Um, I guess like the like like this crossroads of punk where there's like this desire for a um, maybe like a fixed referent after Bretton Woods or um, and how you can reconcile um, romanticism with minimalism in a way that doesn't echo fascism. I think that question would have to be unpacked more because I don't think there's any way that any of those things have a telos or a necessary trajectory. Um, I don't, I, like for example, I don't, I don't no longer buy the narrative that it was romanticism only that led to the camps, you know, the, the, uh, the concentration camps, uh, which was the, uh, uh, which is a very crude reduction of actually what the Frankfurt School wrote. Um, so if you read a book like The Dialectic of Enlightenment, by Adorno and Horkheimer. It's actually a much more complicated argument. It got reduced. Um, it's one of the reasons I'm still a teacher uh, and think about curriculum, uh, because I'm the director of an MFA program. And I, I think a lot about how, what constitutes theory and historicizing theory. And um, like the Frankfurt School was a very short period and Frankfurt School is distinct from theory. Theory is just the ideas you have to make something. The Frankfurt School was a post-war movement uh, that was trying to, uh, are you, are you, is it funny? Or? It's just resonant. Oh, okay. it's, it's just really resonating. Right, because I don't, I, I don't want to be, uh, uh, this is not a class. I realize I wrote a description for a talk that could be a syllabus. Uh, I am recommending stigma. <laughs> Uh, and I don't get no kickback, and I don't know Irving Goffman. Um, so, uh, you know, romanticism, it's just interesting to understand the, uh, for me at this juncture, to understand the antinomies that I inherited within my education. So the anti-aesthetic versus the aesthetic, the beauty, beauty versus the idea, craft versus social practice. I don't, I don't believe in any of those oppositions. Right, like social practice requires craft. Crafts have social histories. Uh, ideas have aesthetics. Aesthetics require ideas. Um, any of those kind of structuring antinomies that were inherited and taught, and have been retaught and then put through the filter. You know, you read *Death of the Author* and you've read Roland Barthes. I'm sorry. You know, uh, you read the *The Lost Minionist Essay* and you've read Foucault. And no, it's, you, know, don't, you don't even have to read those people anymore, frankly. They're really important to me. There's a lot of other thinkers who are doing really interesting things who are building on those ideas. So that's the other thing. I don't have like this touchstone thing. It's like I don't go into the classroom and think, oh, they haven't read Derrida. I don't, why should you read Derrida? I mean, unless you're interested in reading Derrida. Why should you read theory? You shouldn't even read theory, I, I, unless you want to. I only read theory because I like it. <laughs> I see. I know terrible artists who read theory, and I, I, and, I and, and, and I know really good artists who've never read theory. It has nothing to do. You know, the, the, I read a ton of theory, but it's just like it's like it's like parallel. 
I don't even try to translate what I read into what I write. It just, I just find that it comes. How do you avoid fascism? That, 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 that. I believe that an army of the sick cannot be defeated. Let's put it in the context of risk pool. That's why I played Crete and Hop. Right? I believe if you take all the stigmas in the room, and if we all identify at that level, and, and don't prioritize, and don't get into an oppression Olympics, and, and really get our, our intersectional politics on, then we have a chance. And history is to be thought and rethought. And um, yeah, I, I don't have that question. I don't have the answer to that question. I don't even have the right articulation of the question. It's a great question, a great set of questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just want to end with this. I was going to read this. Uh, it's someone else's poem. It's Essex Hemphill. Uh, Essex was a friend of mine. And uh, I miss him. And it it's causes me a great deal of pain that his work is not better known and, and um, you should read his collected volume of poetry ceremonies and uh, a book, very important book Brother to Brother has been brought back into print Redbone Press uh, these are anthologies this book is a, such an important book uh, In the Life by Joseph Beam who died of AIDS in 1986 it's a, a black gay anthology In the Life it's, it's not in print anymore but you can get it and Brother to Brother was the sequel that Essex finished based on uh, Joseph's initial book. This is poem is from 1985, written by Essex Hemphill. It's called Cordon Negro. I drink champagne early in the morning instead of leaving my house with an M16 and nowhere to go. I'm dying twice as fast as any other American between 18 and 35. This disturbs me, but I try not to show it in public. Each morning I open my eyes as a miracle. The blessing of opening them is temporary on any given day. I could be taken out. I could be, I could go off. I could forget to be careful. Even my brothers hunted, hunt me. I am the only one who values my life, and sometimes I don't give a damn. My love life can kill me. I am faced daily with choosing violence or a demeanor that saves every other life but my own. I won't cross over. It's time someone else came to me, not to patronize me physically, sexually, or humorously. I am sick of being an endangered species, sick of being a goddamn statistic. So what are my choices? I could leave with no intention of coming home tonight. I could go crazy downtown and raise hell on a rooftop, rooftop with my rifle, I could live for a brief moment on the six o'clock news, or I could masquerade another day through the corridor of commerce and American dreams. I'm dying twice as fast as any other American. So I pour myself a glass of champagne, I cut it with a drop of orange juice after I swallow my liquid Valium, my private celebration for being alive this morning. I leave my shelter. Our, I guard my life with no apologies. My concerns are small and personal. That was by Essex Hemphill, 1985. Thank you.